needed. Uh, so I hope that it's interactive and helpful and applies to everything we design. How do you well? Do you want the lights off, Audrey? Okay. Um, can you guys see this? Okay, how do we stop it from going pause? There we go. I just use the arrows. Oh, like okay. Right. On or off lights, what do you think? What do you guys like? What's better for the GoPro? Off is great. Off is off great. Looks great. fantastic. Okay. okay, how do I stop this from continuing? Uh, you must have it. Do you have it automatic? I don't know what I did. Yeah, let's see. <laughs> let's see if you're there. I'll stop. It should. It should. Hi! Hi. Hi. Okay. So I love this quote by Margaret Wheatley. All of this started with having one conversation about an experience I had. Oh, there we go again. <laughs> it has a mind of its own. And show. So I think Let's try this. Help me out, the students, if there's anything you I usually then will just go and highlight. I think you go to slideshow and then auto advance yeah. something. There's something that has to be checked. Slideshow. Sorry. No, I thought if you just highlight them all. I don't remember. There's an auto index. So. Yeah, I think I'll if we highlight them all. I'll just do one by one. <laughs> yeah, what is it doing? I'll just click one by one. Over here? Yeah. Okay, Let's just do, do that. Yes. Perfect. Sure, okay? Oh, you yeah. mean to leave it like that? I guess. I'm okay. Just, yeah, whatever. Okay. <laughs> so now you just got to go with it. <laughs> so, anyway, <clears throat> a little bit about me. I am. Uh, Married to Ty Beasley, he teaches here in Norman at Norman High. He's a special ed teacher. We have three boys. And um, by education, I'm a, I'm a, a political science major. I always had a passion for civil rights, and um, I work as a paralegal. I do estate planning and corporate management. I have for 20 years, and uh, so I talk to people about dying, but also setting up business and looking forward to the future. <laughs> so um, I'm a volunteer, an advocate. I'm the chair of the Family Advisory Council at Oklahoma Children's Hospital at OU Health, and I have been for four years. And um, I served on the ICC for the state of Oklahoma, which is where the Department of Health and the Department of Ed come together to form Sooner Start, which from zero to three children with disabilities, can, it's a program they can go through. And I spend a lot of my time doing this right here, talking to people about what equal access means in buildings, and also parks. <clears throat> um, my son Max was born with hydrocephalus. So hydrocephalus is where you create too much cerebrospinal fluid in the interventricles of your brain, which that was um, because he was born with spina bifida, which is where part of your um, the bones in your vertebrae aren't formed correctly, and you, at birth you have a um, spinal cord injury, his defect is that his S2 vertebrae, so way down low, <clears throat> and when he was born, his spinal cord was kind of tasseled a little bit, and they put it back where it needed to go, and, but from that, he has severe nerve damage from his waist down, so his bowels, his bladder, his muscle groups, and next Wednesday, he's going to go in for a detethering surgery, where they re his spinal cord is attached to muscle tissue and they have to go in and release it so his spinal cord can move freely, hopefully relieving a lot of his symptoms he has. But he has very weak neck, leg muscles and no, he does not have the, um, he doesn't know when he needs to go to the restroom. And he also takes medicine to paralyze his bladder muscles because he has what's called a trabeculated bladder. Um, he has to take medicine for that. But anyway, it also makes me have to cath him every four hours. Do you all know what inter clean intermittent catheterization is? Mm -hmm. A lot of people need that for kidney and bladder health, and it's a lot more common than you might think. But anyway, I have to cath him every four hours. This was Mother's Day at my visit at the Oakland Children's Hospital, and the button was not working. I uh, had a mess in the parking lot. The baby changing station was off the wall in the room, and whenever I went to ask where I would cath him at, the nurse or the person at the front office, the desk, said, just go change him out there on the, on the couch. And so I was like, okay, well, he's a baby, right? 
he was um, almost two. And it wasn't until I was capping him in front of a room full of people and all their eyes were on me how incredibly inappropriate that situation was for him and me. Something very private, his restroom need. And I thought that day, well, what am I gonna do whenever I don't have access to a baby changing station? Those things only hold 50 pounds, what am I gonna do? And so I asked the hospital, I decided to have a conversation that mattered one day, and I asked the hospital, um, what are we gonna do about whenever he's 50 pounds, this is the last time Max was on a baby changing station, he weighed 49 pounds then, it was three years ago. He now weighs 87 and is in uh, kindergarten, and six and a half years old. So it, it started a conversation about we need to form a family advisory council with the hospital, and a group of amazing parents and volunteers and um, came around and formed the Family Advisory Council and together we worked to get a changing table at the Children's Hospital. In the meantime, I asked, um, I met with our state representative and he um, helped me draft Max's Law. In 2020, Max's Law had a lot of support and we can go in and talk about Max's Law and, and how four years later uh, we still have legislators in the state of Oklahoma that are perfectly content with Oklahomans being naked in parking lots and directed to the floor in our restrooms. But we're in year four and uh, it's not going to get out of committee. But anyway, I hope you'll educate yourself on Max's Law, but I'm here today to talk to you about why Max's Law is important. So. This is after our capital renovation. We just spent $280 million on a capital renovation. And we have a, a medical table in our Oklahoma State Capitol building covered in duct tape with a, with a um, leader of our Senate, Senate pro temp, Greg Tree, refusing to replace that with a $2,500 table that would move up and down and accommodate um, Max's restroom needs. It took five attorneys in four years to get him agreed to do that. <clears throat> ADA grievance procedures protect disabled Americans from those who refuse to acknowledge their federal rights. So there's the 2010 Standards for Accessible Design, right? And there's being compliant with the 2010 Standards for Accessible Design and being ADA compliant. So we can have barriers. There's barriers in this building. So if, I, if Max were with me today, where do you think Max would have restroom access in this building? And if I asked any random employee of this building, where would, I, where would I have restroom accommodations for Max in this building? What do you think they would say? They might offer this table or assume I can pick him up off the floor and off of the floor. But the real, the, the, the reasonable answer to that is, I don't know. But this building is a Title II building covered under the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990. And if Max were here with me today and, and an employee of this building were to direct, direct me to the floor or the table and not offer a reasonable accommodation, I would have to file if they didn't want to fix the problem, I could file an ADA grievance with the University of Oklahoma, and then I would have to force them to provide restroom access here. So we have a known barrier in society, right? When we have a known barrier in society, you know, caregivers and self-advocates can file an ADA grievance on a building, that's where you all come in, is that you're building, the, you're, you're building those buildings, and you can go above and beyond outdated minimum building standards until those come to play, right? Because the buildings you're gonna build, you're gonna build them for everybody, right? I had to change him in my car twice at the Capitol. And every building you look at, accessible parking's right in front. So, no qualified individual with a disability shall, by reason of such disability, be excluded from participation in or be denied the benefits of the services, programs, 
or activities of a public entity or be subjected to discrimination by any such entity. That right there is what it took four years to explain to leadership in our Capitol building that disabled Americans should not be naked in a parking lot or directed to the floor in that building. Four years. <laughs> it's still not installed. It's got a work order. So Title III, Title III buildings are um, schools, movie theaters, recreation facilities, doctor's offices. This is my friend Connor, and I have permission from his mom to show that picture, but that was just a year ago at Integris Baptist Medical Center. This floor in the middle, that's at Penn Square Mall. And this is the space at Children's Hospital. This is before my, the, the table was installed. But that area, <clears throat> that area is safe for, for equipment and a caregiver that is not, that is not um, space held for someone to be on the floor in our bathrooms, is it? So Max goes in to have surgery next week, but this picture was taken right after he had bilateral femoral head surgery. So they took his femurs and cut the heads off and rotated them. He had a lot of hardware. Anyway, so could you imagine lifting a, a child, because he'll have that surgery again in a few years, and by then he might be 130 pounds, but could you imagine lifting him down to the floor and then back up again in a wheelchair? So the floor isn't even really an option. It's not equal or equitable treatment. So diving into how are we in, uh, this was 2020, 2019 is whenever I started really diving into this, but how are we 30 years past the ADA and we still don't have restroom access for just some of our disabled Americans? And I start diving in, and uh, Congressman David uh, Cicilline, he actually is stepping away from Congress as of yesterday, he announced it, but he introduced leg federal legislation called the Babies Act. And so if you go into any federal building, they have a baby changing station in that building. But what they did is they failed to explicitly, they failed explicit federal protections for those weighing 51 pounds or more. Because all baby changing stations max out at 50 pounds. So I took this, this issue, like I did with Children's Hospital, to the Well Rogers World Airport. And at the time, Karen Carney was out there, and I said, where would my son have restroom access in this building? And she didn't like the idea that we would either be returning to a car or letting uh, disabled Americans sit in soil, or directing them to the floor, or the terminal, a bench on the terminal in front of everybody. So she went to work right away. But that got me into all of our airports under federal aviation, the, uh, the FAA laws, regulations, they have what's called service animal relief areas. Mm -hmm. And we need service animal relief areas because we have disabled Americans that need service animals, and they can't be going outside passing through checkpoints. They need to be able to relieve themselves and go back on, right? But there was a time for about three years in Oklahoma City where service animals had more, well, more longer than that, had more federal protections and still do, but more access to the Will Rogers World Airport. Our service animals had restroom access, but Max did not. <clears throat> The Science Museum of Oklahoma was the first one that acted really quickly. Within months, they had installed this medical table up in their family restroom. It was in the back, on the second floor, fairly far from the from anything in the in the entrance. But at the time, that was what was um, it's a, that's called a temporary accommodation. And then Woven Life generously and uh, generously donated a height adjustable changing table. It's a $2,400 table. You can find it in Curiosity. I don't know if y'all have ever been to the Science Museum of Oklahoma, but it's a fun place to play. Mm -hmm. um, but in this restroom right here, you'll find that table. It was the first high adjustable changing table in a museum in the state of Oklahoma. So here's my people at the uh, Family Advisor Council. So this is an older picture, so there's a few of them that are missing. But all of those people have children that, that um, Oklahoma Children's Hospital has helped out quite a bit. And this was the first adult size height adjustable changing table in a state owned building and hospital in the state of Oklahoma. 
and it's wayfinding. So not only just putting in the table in, in a, in a room that is equal to access that you and I are used to, but wayfinding is important too. So any of these the uh, directories, looking at accessibility pages, if you'll write this down, I want you to go check out the Oklahoma History Center's accessibility page on their website. And all of those accommodations should be thought of uh, when planning a building because those are the people that are going to be visiting these buildings. So where's a nursing mother's room? Where is accommodation, where's a quiet space for those on spectrum disorder? You know, is there sensory kits available? Do we have vision, hearing impaired? Do we have all these issues covered in a building that provide basic human needs for people entering that building and to have the full experience like a neurotypical, um, any neurotypical person would. This is the second uh, changing table installed at the Oklahoma History Center. And uh, Dan Provo, I, I ran into uh, Trey Thompson. If you don't know who Trey Thompson is, he is the cap over the Capitol Restoration Project. And I uh, ran into him at the Capitol one day and gave him a wheelie and said, hey, I need to talk to you. And in a couple of hours, a couple of days, he had me on the phone with Dan Provo, the director of there. And within a couple of months, this was uh, installed. So I got to meet um, Hans. Yes. Yeah, and he helped plan Scissor Tail Park. So this is a cement bench that um, I advocated for at Ruby Grant Park five years ago. I don't know if y'all, who's been to Ruby Grant? You gotta go! It's the most inclusive park in the state of Oklahoma. It is barrier free. It is amazing what they've done out there. But um, my husband and I went to a planning commission meeting and we were like, my, my our son, uh, he's gonna outgrow baby changing stations. What, what's the solution there? And this is what the developers of Ruby Grant Park came up with, is that a cement bench that's indestructible and at the same height as an adult size wheelchair for easy transition. So yes, you're gonna have a caregiver bending over, but there's also room there for a caregiver to sit down, or but to have a baby changing station or to put a $2,300 height adjustable table inside a park, um, chances are it's probably gonna get vandalized just because people are brutal to city parks. But this, that's what I've been advocating for at Scissor Tail Park because right now that's all they offer on the, on the northern end of the park. The southern end of the park was um, recently opened and we do have an adult size changing table um, that it, it sits up about this high. And the problem with the ones that are mounted to the wall that are adult size is there's gonna be a time just, I can imagine Max being your size someday soon. Do you think I could lift you up out of a chair and put you on, on, a, on a table sitting here without hurting myself or dropping you? Yeah. It'd be hard, wouldn't it? So but could you envision yourself being in a wheelchair and transitioning over to a bench or me helping you transition, slide you over? So that's how one, that's, and plus it's 800 bucks versus, anyway. I'll have to tell you, when we have more time one time, maybe we'll tell you a story about uh, how people can be brutal in the parks. <clears throat> but this is what it looks like. In every family restroom in Green Grant Park here in Norman will find those benches. And it's what I've included on my code proposal change for the city of Oklahoma City. So this is what a service animal relief area looks at like at an airport. They converted a family restroom into a service animal relief area because there was new federal regulations that came out. But in doing so, that was the space that could have accommodated an adult size changing table, but they had no other place to move the service animal relief area. So um, they, had to, they had to convert the nursing mother's room. This used to be a nursing mother's room at uh, Little Rogers World Airport. This is the 17th airport in the nation to put one in, and now there's 18 airports. So when you're talking about hundreds of airports across the United States, I think it's pretty cool that we came in like top first, right? So when they redid um, the terminal, there's a there's two nursing mothers rooms now, one on each end, and this took up the old nursing mothers room. Oklahoma City Convention. Anybody live in Oklahoma City? 
So MAPS, are you familiar with MAPS projects? Yeah. So Oklahoma City Convention Center was a MAPS 3 project, and the first day it was open, Mayor Holt says, hey, come down, check out our new convention center, it's beautiful. And I called, and I didn't go down, but I called and I said, you know, if I brought my son, my family down, and my son needed restroom access, and he's out there on the baby changing station, where would you direct me? And I had leadership in that building to direct me to the floor in the restroom. First day it was open. <laughs> so that conversation led me to Tom Anderson, which he's retired now, but uh, Tom Anderson led me to Keith Wilkinson, who's the ADA coordinator for the city of Oklahoma City. And he's been working for the city for a whole long time, and he said, you know, I've never had this issue brought to me, but now that I see it, I see it everywhere I go. And he, he's the one that kind of said, hey, we're gonna go arm in arm, and we're gonna, we're gonna either amend a code that's coming down, the state has all their code changes, right? All their, from statutes and case law, and there's 76 jurisdictions across the state, and everybody's changing their codes, or updating their code standards. And we just happened to catch it at the right time, and so I submitted a proposal to the Oklahoma City Building Code Commission for an amendment to the uh, to how Oklahoma City defines a family restroom, and that if a if a building size is big enough to trigger, that's all very important um, signs, signage. So when we went out to the Will Rogers World Airport, they still didn't put up their signs, and so even if you were walking by and knew there was one in the airport, there wasn't even a sign on the wall saying it was there, but. Um, they're working on getting all the wayfinding uh, up to date. So Max, Max's Law. Um, I want you guys to take off this uh, card and um, I want you each to have one of these wheelies. I want you to know these come all over the world. I'm not kidding. Canada. I started collecting these a whole long time ago, back in 2019 because I believe that people need to be represented in planning, in the toy aisle, and for, I don't know that one's coming. They've been everywhere. This one's kind of, can you help me? Yeah, help me back them out. But um, when Mattel knew I was using these for advocacy tools, I showed up one day and there was two boxes sitting on my porch. So if you get a pink one by chance, that might be one from Mattel. But every leader, I probably have handed out close to a thousand of these or more. But every leader at all of our legislators, every leader in our city, um, I'll make sure that, the, that Hans gets one. But I hope that you'll keep that and remember that um, people need representation, right? When we were kids, I don't, I'm 44, y'all are a lot younger than me, but when I was a kid, disability was not represented on the toy aisle at all. And, you know, thoughtful planning isn't, isn't represented very much either. And aside from women, disabled individuals are the largest minority group in the country and the least underrepresented. Um, underrepresented. So um, I want to give this time an opportunity for y'all to talk and have, ask questions. And, um, Does everybody have one of these? Do you want everybody to have? I brought voter registration cards. Yeah. Just in case any of you are not voters, I would love for you to take one and become a registered voter. So yeah. there's two different ones, though, right? So there's. No. There's My name is Doug. Yeah, there's the same. Yeah. These two I have the same. Okay. So no, we can go over this one. Does everybody have one of these? Mm -hmm. I realize I didn't bring you the water I told you it was going to okay. so okay. That's why I ran and got it. So Q and A time. Questions? So there was a mother. There was a mother that advocated for this. She went before the International Code Commission and said, "We need change." We've been. I've I've reached out to my members of Congress for five years, and none of them, even knowing that their federal buildings that they office in do not have restroom access for Max, they just refuse to help me on this issue. And there's not an advocate nationwide that has gotten the ear of a Congress member of Congress. We've got disabled Americans being directed to the floor by other Americans and half naked in parking lots. And we have legislators in the state of Oklahoma who work actively work against that change and members of Congress that don't take the, the, the issue seriously. So anyway, the International Code Commission and it's um, code proposals, so it kind of goes, you guys probably, he could probably tell you more, but 
kind of goes hand in hand, step by step, as soon as the ADA standards for accessible design are updated, the international code standards, and that, that's what, so whenever you travel to foreign lands, you know, you go to Canada, you can expect to see the similar accommodations there, whether it's traffic signals, restrooms. Speaking of Canada, Canada, Australia, and the United Kingdom are two decades, two decades ahead of us in this planning. Two decades. You go to Australia and they actually have just restroom pavilions. And um, if you're, you can apply for a key and go in and they have, they have hoist track systems so anybody in society can go out and participate and go to Scissor Tail Park or anywhere. But we're so far behind on that. Anyway, so this had unanimous support from the International Code Commission. And I hope you'll take a moment and read through it. Um, schools are included. Schools are included. This school, University of Oklahoma, is included in the ADA. It's federal protections. So if Max were to come here and still need caregiver assistance, uh, we're hoping that he will be old enough to start caring for things on his own more, that now it's really hard for him. But he would, he would have an opportunity to come and study at the School of Architecture and not worry about his restroom needs while here. Okay, so any questions? So with these tables, how much clear space do you need around to maneuver if you're using them in this area? Because I know like for wheelchairs and stuff, we have a requirement on that. So the if we were putting a table in, like, how much would we need? The same radius as going through a door. No problem. So 32, was it 32 inches, 33 inches? Um, you still need the maneuverability of going around the table. I'll pull up the one. So this is on. This is located. This is on a wall, but there couldn't there couldn't be anything blocking that, right? That's not really a good picture. This one. So you have act when that when that folds down. Yeah, the the door to this family restroom swings open here. Yeah, so the, the main access point is from like the long side, not the short side. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because the the table folds down, and then this hand control. You have several options with these. You can either have a hand control or a foot pedal. Which one's best for the individual with disabilities? Hand control. Because they can do it themselves. So when when um, Max goes to use the table at this. So this, this folds down, and then it lowers. I give him the remote control, and he can lower it down, and then slide over, and then raise himself up, and then I can help with this, because he's got AFOs, which are ankle braces, uh, SMOs, AFOs, and his shoes, and then pants, and he can only stand for about 30 seconds right now. So there's no way that, if he wears pull-ups, um, but this I can, I have time to, or I have, a, and it comes way up here. Then I just take all of his shoes off, and his braces off, and his pants off, help get a new pull-up on, get him dressed again, and then he can lower himself down and get off. So all I have to do is assist him with getting his shoes and pants back on. And I'm not down here on the floor bending over, right? Could you imagine going to the Will Rogers World Airport with your grandma and having to change her on the floor if you took her to Disney World. <laughs> That'll never happen at the Will Rogers World Airport that's, again. That's what I was wondering. I don't know how to form the question, but just thinking is like people get older, you know, different health circumstances, like people with bladder cancer have a mm -hmm. port that goes into a bag. I don't know all the you know, mm -hmm. correct terminology, but just thinking about all the different options and maybe there's even more than your ability or things to do as, yeah. as there's different conditions or different age groups too. Well think about, does anybody have a, a loved one in the uh, an assisted living center? A grandparent? Yeah, yes. yeah. yeah, so my grandmother spent the last year of her life with Parkinson's and the medicine that they treat Parkinson's with basically can paralyze you at times, depending on how bad your Parkinson's is. But um, we couldn't have taken her anywhere. 
Mm. Now, with now we could. We can actually go to the airport and actually take her on vacation. Because there's other airports, right? All, all Florida airports, have, they're all getting tables. Mm. A lot of them have them. Well, that brings up a really good point. I mean, is it only buildings? It's not about transportation, right? Because I mean, planes and trains, I mean, they have the tiniest restrooms ever. You can look at, right, you can look at the, um, the advocacy work for planes and making those restrooms more uh, accessible and people are wanting to stay in their motorized wheelchairs and making those accessible with a motorized wheelchair in them. If you're talking about a lot of real estate within yeah. a tiny airplane. Or even a place to sit in the plane, right? Not yeah. only just not the restroom only. Wow. Yeah, if you were to take a bus, <laughs> we went on a bus trip, wants to go skiing, and you can imagine uh, this tiny, tiny, tiny little restroom inside a bus. Mm -hmm. Those are a lot of issues that are presenting right now. Is, is there any additional support needed in the wall, like just to attach? Is it some plywood backing? Yep. You're, if, if you don't have you don't have the support back there, you have to put one for a wall-mounted one. Whereas the one at the, at the um, Science Museum, this is the one that's real popular. Yeah. Um, you, don't, you don't need that. But also, the, the wall-mounted one offers more space. So if you were to go into these restrooms just down here, it popped in real quick. Um, I would have to measure, but just moving the partition wall from swinging out this way to swinging out this way, making that accessible stall really big, you might be able to get a, a, a wall-mounted one back there, but it costs more money because you got to put supports back there, yeah. drop a cord and change the partition wall, whereas these, if there's room for them, they're, they're the best. So I thought of, I don't want to say baby, right, but a, ch a changing station I thought couldn't be inside a stall. Like, it's better to have one than not. Right. It's there's no to regulating it. There's and, nothing regulating. Yeah. That's why we need code. That's yeah. why we need building codes. So when we're building new or renovating old, they know what to do. Mm -hmm. oh, you mentioned in the World Warriors Airport, mm -hmm. it's in the nursery bathrooms, like the mother's nursery. Is that where? they relocated it? Okay. So when they we had a, a new terminal put in, the terminal was mentioned out there. They relocated the nursing mother's room to the new terminal. So where this used to be a nursing mother's room, now it's, if, if, if you walk outside this door, there's a door over here too, and this is the men's restroom, and down this way is the women's restroom. So there's not even a sink in this room. And whenever I went into there to tour, they didn't even have a, 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 a trash can. It was just the table in a room. <laughs> I'm like, we need, we need access to water, we need a trash can, we need something to wipe it down with. Um, there wasn't, but that had just been installed too, okay? And so if there's nothing regulating on what to do, nobody, we're, we're literally just trailblazing accessible restrooms in 2023, <laughs> right? And we have people in the Oklahoma legislature fighting this. It took four years to put a table like at the Science Museum of Oklahoma to convince Senator Greg Tree that Oklahomans need a, a, a twenty a $2,400 table. He spent more than that on attorney's fees fighting me. <laughs> what was his argument against it? Um, because yeah. it wasn't included in the 2010 ADA standards for accessible design and we just had a newly renovated capital that was um, that passed code inspection, and he didn't understand the difference between being in compliance with the standards and being in compliance with the ADA. It took it took me and the Disability Law Center literally just like there's a difference. He didn't want to acknowledge the difference, so he would rather be he he chose in his choosing because the the bill is going nowhere. And maybe you guys can sit down and email your state legislators tonight and say. Why is it Max's law for progressing in the legislature? But anyway, yes, $2,300. A lot of my time. And if you'll join that group on Facebook, you'll get to see all about it. Uh, that's a question. What about, like, I saw that now OU Health has one. 
But what about the smaller clinics? I mean, I think about the dentists. I think about physical therapy. Uh, has has there has there is there any small clinic in Oklahoma that has one of those? Um, there's been a lot of places put in the medical table. You'll find these a lot of places, like the Discovery Lab in Tulsa. Um, they just this week, last week they put one in. But if it's not a requirement, then they don't. And if it's not brought to their attention, hey, we have a visitor that needs restroom access, um, they don't have to put one in. But yeah, Max has goes to dental appointments. Our dentist office does not have an adult size changing table for him, and I've I've never asked for that either. But the issue has never come up. So, but if he were to go get his teeth cleaned and um, have an unexpected bowel movement while there, I would either be forced to leave the appointment or change him in my car. But if we're building brand new dental facilities, then we have we can make um, instead of if you're if you have small office buildings like that, you know, all perfect. What are they called? All not uh, unisex restrooms, family restrooms. We used to, if y'all ever get real bored, you can study up the history of restrooms. <laughs> but prior to women entering the workforce, you didn't have men and women's restrooms. In fact, if you go into really, really old buildings, that didn't come into play until men became uncomfortable having women in the restroom with them, or vice versa. So now we're deciding as society, maybe it's best to have a restroom that accommodates all people, including a, an adult size changing table, and maybe another restroom that accommodates all people that doesn't necessarily need one in smaller clinics like that, instead of a men and women's restroom. Because what if there's two women that need to go pee, and then we just, you know, <laughs> both go at the same time? Yeah. What else could be helpful? Because I'm thinking about, it sounds like you bring wipes and pull-ups and right all of that the supplies yeah. but then i mean i know as a practicing architect i design a, a non-gender specific or women's restroom so i've done a nap, napkin dispenser yeah the disposal right we got paper towel dispenser toilet paper it's not like bring your own stuff all the time mm -hmm. right so is there really the possibility and need of having dispensers for diapers and pull-ups and wipes a hand sanitizer. Yep. So, whenever I'm helping him get ready and he's on the table, then the sink, I uh, get him settled and the sink is over here. But my hands can be sanitized in, in clean intermittent catheterizations. I'm basically inserting a tube mm -hmm. into his urethra to drain his bladder. But anything that's on my hand is also going into his bladder. Yeah. So, having a hand sanitizer like close by, and then maybe just a little shelf to put a, a little disinfectant thing so when I, I'm done, I can clean it off. Even though we have a, we, we travel with a, a pad, a washable, it's like a big pillowcase basically. But to have like a Clorox wipe there too, that I can clean up and make sure that I'm leaving it clean and as clean as possible for the next person. And instructions, so right here, you can't really see it, but right there, those are the instructions on how to operate this because if you were to walk in and see that, before today, would you know what it was? So we're normalizing needs, and I'm hoping that we can start normalizing an adult size changing table in our family restrooms. And so whenever you look at that, you walk in with your child, I don't know what to do with this. The instructions tell you to just pull it down, it just, you know, it drops. And then this is just an up down, that's all the, the only options there. That's all you do is pull it down, Use up or down, go up, up and down. <laughs> but yeah, if I were to walk in and not know what that is, I'd be like, what? What is that? So instructions, wipes. Children's Health, the Bethany Children's Health Center, even if you go in there, they have a whole cabinet of every possible supply, all size, diapers, wipes, it's beautiful. So for privacy, it's obviously better to be in a separate you know unisex and non-gender specific room yeah. i've had conversations with a few other faculty who saw articles that like starbucks is trying to not have public restrooms because homeless people go in there and sleep or people are doing drugs mm -hmm. right so i mean i my mind starts to go there about like 
how I guess we can't prevent you know how it gets misused. But someone might see that as a place for someone to sleep. There was some you know something else that would still prevent you from being able to access it. You know, mm -hmm. I was in a, the the eighth or the eighth largest library on the planet, which is in Seattle. It's beautiful, and they had a um, a used needle dispenser in their restroom, and I'd never seen that before. Yeah. And I said, "Well, why?" Why do you have that? And they're like, well, people come in here and use drugs, yeah. and they might as well be leaving their, discarding their safely, because we can't stop them from coming in and using drugs in the bathroom, but we can help them leave the environment clean when they're done. Yeah, there's like so lawsuits I, because I guess people are going in there and dying too, right? And then they're stuck and no one can get them for hours, and then the families are suing because they provided a lockable restroom. Unbelievable. So we took it, which if you'll attend tomorrow, I'm speaking before the AIA um, tomorrow, the Women in Architecture, and tomorrow I'm diving into more of the federal buildings I've been working with. So I took a trip to from here to Seattle and back. My little sister lives up there. And on the way, we stopped at the Blackwell Visitor Center. We stopped at the Crazy Horse um, Monument and the um, Mount Rushmore and Yellowstone National Park and at all places <laughs> at Blackwell Visitor Center I changed Max in the back of my car this was after House Bill 3015 died Senator Paul Rosino killed that bill didn't believe that these were needed in our visitor centers but if I can go file an ADA grievance with ODOT and force the o State uh, Oklahoma Department of Transportation to put these in and all eight of our visitor centers Maybe he should have let his committee hear the bill, right? So, um, <clears throat> anyway, Blackwell Visitor Center, and we went up to um, Mount Rushmore, and I had a National Park Ranger tell me to put him on the floor. At the Crazy Horse Monument, and the people there were so very kind, and they just, they offered a table in a conference room. But that's where a place like this, so could you imagine someone having their diaper changed on one of these tables? Um, and then at Yellowstone National Park, I had someone, uh, a park ranger, drive into the floor in a tourist visit visitor center. I found a park bench, or not a park bench, but a shower bench to change him on. It was about this narrow, about that long, but it worked. It wouldn't work for, you're just going to be my, you're going to be my, my person. It wouldn't work for you. So I filed an ADA grievance with the National Park Service, and I have a complaint with the United States Department of the Interior. So if Congress won't talk to me about the lack of restroom access in their office buildings and at the White House Visitor Center, you know if we went to the White House Visitor Center, we could all load up and go, and someone in that building would direct Max to the floor, then how would we all react to that? It's an issue for Congress, isn't it? So, I, But caregivers um, going in and me filing ADA grievances on buildings, on our visitor centers, on the state capitol buildings. I shouldn't have to be doing that. We shouldn't have lawmakers in the state of Oklahoma fighting against that anyway, or members of Congress ignoring it. Caregivers do a lot, and it's the hardest job on the planet. I love my child, and uh, I, would do, I, would, I would do it tenfold. But having to fight for his federal rights to a safe and healthy restroom, <laughs> everywhere we go because now i can't just be quiet about it right maybe one of you guys can 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 carry the conversation forward at the university of oklahoma but if we went to a basketball game at the lord noble center where do you think i'd change his pants or where do you think i have changed his pants because we like to go i'm changing him on the floor in a conference room at the lord noble center What about the stadium? We went to, a, he hasn't been to a football game yet, but if we chose to go to a, a OU football game, where do you think I'd change his diaper if he needed it? It's 2023. <laughs> so now every time you see a restroom, you're gonna think of Max. <laughs> you're gonna think, where would Max have restroom access? What can we do, Audrey, to help? 
Like, I know there's the send something to the legislature, right? Yes. Is there a, a, a fund to contribute to to help? Is there something that we can? Yes. I guess it's just money, right? But I'm talking about like, how can we go make this a bigger issue and get it? I, want, I would love for each one of you to, to take this wheelie, maybe put it on your desk, open it up, pop it in your pocket. But anytime you're on a project, I want you to remember this conversation and carry it forward when you can. So if you want to reach out to the University of Oklahoma and said, hey, Audrey Beasley came and talked to us about Max Love Day, who, you know, just by one email, one of you sending an email to somebody about the stadium or the Noble Center, this building. Do you know how incredible it feels when you finally get a table installed on the work you've done? One of you could get a table in this building just by starting the conversation. Where would Max have restroom access in this building? It could be the first building on campus to have one. <laughs> I like to be first. It's fun. I don't make the decisions, but if you all decide to build one and put it in the restroom, I won't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if you don't, well, if you're not registered, <laughs> if you're not registered to vote, I hopefully you will stop by and get a voter registration packet. And then if you'll go to findmylegislatorok.gov, if you don't know who your state representative or your state senator is, I hope you will take the time today and. Um, Find them and reach out and say, what are you personally doing to support Max's law? And why are we in year four of this? Find my legislator. Find okay. my legislator, ok.gov. And you can reach out to members of Congress, too. And if you, when you go to find my legislator, ok.gov, it'll tell you who your members of Congress are and your state. And State representative and your state senator. Is anyone planning to attend the AA? I put the link on Canvas a couple weeks ago. So we go back. Is anyone still allow that? What time is it? 12, 12 to 9. Okay. As many of us can be there to support all group. And then I can't remember if, uh, if I asked Melissa, I don't know if she contacted you. Maybe you can record it tomorrow we can share it? I will reach out um, okay. tonight and ask that they, they be recorded, and then maybe you guys can take a look at it. Yep. Okay. Any more questions? I do. So, I'm a mom of three boys as well, so everything you said, it, it hits a spot. Mm -hmm. You know, I understand you. I don't have a child with disabilities, but I have experience having to roll around the shoulder, the whole stroll too, so it's huge, right? And, and, and wondering where am I gonna change my babies or where am I gonna make them because they're scared of that table or whatever the case may be. So I, trust me, you've touched a, a part of me that girl. So with that being said, are there any other challenges that you face? You know, we already understand bathrooms, but is there any other places that you feel like, wow, you know, this is challenging for me to maneuver to do because when we are all designing a building, it's it's so easy to think about what we want and how we move, we're able bodied, but sometimes we don't take into consideration how it feels to be seated or pushing the shoulder. Mm -hmm. Most of us don't you know, they haven't pushed the shoulder perhaps so they don't understand. Mm -hmm. What are other challenges that you face as a mother with a child with disabilities? How can we help you? What should we keep in mind? You know, like I said, it's one thing is you walk in, one thing is you think from this position that mm -hmm. what can we do? Oh my goodness. So parks, um, wood chips, curbs, anything that barrier, any barrier like a curb or even a dumpster set in place of a, of a curb cut. I just experienced that last weekend. Well, MAPS 3 planning had us out to Southern Oaks Library or Recreation Center. Come out and let's talk about parks and accessibility. And there they have a dumpster parked right in front of the curb cut. <laughs> That's the first thing I noticed when I got out of my car. And I'm like, I just ran for Oklahoma City Council and I didn't make the primary. But anyway, so uh, this all this work led me to want to do that. But anyway. Go into all these planning meetings and you know informing myself on the rapid transit that Oklahoma City is, is looking at implementing and our parks and 
everywhere we go. I mean, even accessibility, accessible parking misuse and abuse. It's horrible, and it's a five hundred dollar fine in the state of Oklahoma. Brad Henry uh, smacked a good one on, but they, and it's so high. It's, the tickets are so high that Oklahoma City Police does, don't like to ticket people because it's a five hundred dollar ticket. But if we don't have police officers ticketing for accessible parking abuse, then it just it's really, it runs rampant, right? So maybe we need to look at making that fine more reasonable and start ticketing everybody. So don't ever park in accessible parking. But yeah, just just man-made barriers. Like it, no one. Well, it's it's closer for us to have the dumpster there because we work here and we want to just carry it out and we're done and throw it away. Whereas the dumpster should have been way back there because it's an eyesore anyway. Keep it over there, and the employees just have to walk to the end of the parking lot to throw the stuff away. But there's barriers everywhere. Just imagine walking alongside a six shirt, six and a half year old that uses a walker and wheelchair. Yeah. Even privately, may I ask? Um, I know that you know when it comes to private housing, it, it's another ballpark. But um, we recently, at the last semester, in my studio, we worked on um, housing, ADA housing, and, and you know if you don't think about it until you're actually in that position of somebody in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. What struggles do you have with private housing? I mean, the bathroom. I can only imagine the bathrooms in your house, or, or how do you handle he, these things? He can't go to some people's houses because we have friends that live in like a two-story apartment. He can he can crawl up bleachers and crawl up steps. And so one one time we were at a, at a <coughs> archery tournament at the kids' school, and Max was using his walker and wanted to go sit by one of the teachers. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, okay, we'll see you later. And she goes, hey, Audra, how's he going to get up here? I'm like, he can get up there. Well, he just parked his walker and he crawled up the bleachers. That's his normal. It looks different to you and I, but for him, that's how he gets up bleachers. And to get upstairs, he'll go behind, he'll go backwards. But he can get upstairs. So, right. Well, I, I, I'm going to get to a point where he weighs uh, almost 90 pounds. I can't, I've had three pulled, I power lift. I Olympic power lift, you guys. I know it doesn't look like it, but I do. <laughs> but I started working out a couple of years ago because I kept getting pulled groin muscles, lifting him all the time. And I'm getting to, I can still lift him, but I shouldn't be lifting him. So he has to be able to do what, even getting into the car, out of the car, in bed, out of bed, into the bed. He's, we have a, when we, I was pregnant and we redid our bathroom um, with him. But anyway, we got one of those really deep soaking tubs because I'm so tall, I just wanted to just, mm -hmm. but he still can't get in it on his own. Yeah, we're talking about a kid. Now imagine, they're not going to get What about our parents, right. grandparents? So I'm really glad that I met you today because this is something that always goes to my mind. I'm mm -hmm. really passionate about the whole ADA and universal design. Am I great at designing? No, but just keeping people like you, your son, mm -hmm. and being my own grandparents and mine. Thank you for that. Yeah, I had I had this I had this client recently. She's become a friend now, but her son encouraged her to build an ADA friendly house, and I hope that that would just become the standard. Yeah. Why can't we just build them ADA? The the doors are a little wider. You think of tile. So coming into her home, there's no step up to come to her door. You go to you park in her driveway, and it's just a constant flow, right? There's no barriers. And then when you walk through her entryway and you walk into her kitchen, into her, even into her bedroom, there is a path of tile that comes around. She still has carpet in her bedroom, but there's a path of tile that goes from her front door, through her kitchen, through her bedroom, down through her bathroom, to this like office area. It literally, when, you, when, you, when it's pointed out, it looks like just a, a track of tile, but there's still carpet in the rooms where it's appropriate. So that was the first time I'd been into a home and thought, I need a home like this. Like we can still have carpet, but on the main thoroughfares and track areas, there's tile and all these doors are wide and there's no, there's not even a threshold bump. It's, it's all fluid. And I, there, I've read some articles about that just becoming the standard and why can't we, why would anybody not want a wider door? Is there a reason for that? It's just cost? Yeah. yeah it's more space, more money. You know, more distance for everything. Mm -hmm. It got me thinking, though, too, when you said that once you hit six fixtures, you need the family restroom, right? There's walls like that or codes. 
Same thing with the area of refuge. So when you were just talking about that, I think it, as I tell students all the time, like it doesn't matter if there's one person in the building, there should still be an area of refuge at the stairs. Because like, what if you can't physically carry the person, right? Then you get in the area of refuge and wait for firefighters or wait for the emergency to end. But if the code defines that to be like once you have so many people or the type of occupancy type, you know, and even fire ratings of it. So it's like, let's just have a two hour enclosure and have an area of refuge where people could be in a wheelchair or cane or strollers. Because mm -hmm. you know, the elevators don't work, they're recalled. Oh, I want to carry them out. Don't help me, he's crying. Like, oh, help me. <laughs> I can't, we carry them out. Uh, that would be very hard in yeah. that situation. And we had, to, we had to address that situation on his IEP, too. So yeah. In the middle, he, they, my kids go to school at John Ranks right in the middle of downtown Oklahoma City. And uh, just putting in what ifs into his IEP. Yeah. He's responsible for him in that situation. Yeah. Uh, one last question or thought? It's been super informative. Really appreciate you being here today. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.